Welcome back to Capital Beat, a joint project between Orca Media and the Vermont Press Bureau. Joining me as usual is Josh O'Gorman of the Vermont Press Bureau. I'm Neil Goswami. This week, uh, there was a pretty big pot hearing in the House chamber. House lawmakers were trying to uh, hear from the public um, about this pending legislation to legalize marijuana. Josh, you were there. What was the what was the scene like in the House, and what did they hear? Well, it was uh, no pun intended a joint hearing between the House House Judiciary and the House Government Operations Committee. Uh, GovOps is probably going to get the bill, assuming that it gets out of House Judiciary, maybe mm -hmm. next week. Okay. Um, so uh, there was roughly about sixty people that offered testimony. Um, of the those, uh, like 34 roughly, I think, were in favor, 19 were against, and five were undecided. Mm -hmm. And of those people that were opposed to it, these were people, many of them, like, favored legalization in theory, but were not happy with the way that the bill was mm -hmm. approaching it. Uh, for ex example, the bill prohibits uh, people growing their own for personal use. Right. Uh, instead, setting up what some people refer to as a monopoly, uh, in which uh, if you have up towards $25,000 for a non-refundable application fee mm -hmm. um, that you, there's no guarantee you're going to get your license right um, so this is really uh, really thinned uh, the, the, the herd I guess the, okay. the people who are going to be able to do this uh, there are also people who were opposed to the fact that it bans uh, concentrates or tinctures uh, we heard testimony from a woman from Weston who's a medical marijuana patient mm -hmm. and uh, she uses a tincture rather than smokes she uh, talked about mixing it with alcohol and making a substance of yes some sort. yes uh, so basically it's uh, THC infused alcohol and this she said works best for her pain management okay. and um, under the terms of this bill it, that, that would be abolished you would right. be allowed, allowed to do right. that even as a medical patient okay. um, however in general uh, people were pretty, pretty pretty positive for sure they alternated uh, pro and con pro and con mm -hmm. and uh, the cons ran out long before the pros did yeah um, so we heard a lot of the same arguments which is uh, hey this it's already here it's already in our state it's already legal uh, let's get some tax revenue and take this money out of the hands of, of the black market. Uh, we heard a lot of the similar contrarian arguments, which are this is bad for our youth, mm -hmm. and uh, this is going to make our highways less safe, and there's no way to accurately test to see if somebody's impaired. Okay. Um, so those are the arguments that we heard last night, which pretty much mirror the arguments that we've been hearing since January when this thing first started right, out in, right. in the Senate. And so we're thinking maybe next week the House Appropriations Committee will actually get down to whether or not it's going to advance? Uh, that'd be the judiciary is, uh, what, sorry. is what we're looking at. Yeah. Um, and uh, my understanding was they were going to take three, three weeks on it. And okay. uh, now we're Friday, we're at right, right, the end of our second week. Okay. Um, so I think you do need time because roughly we've got about a month left right. in, in this uh, session, as I understand yeah. it. Um, so it needs time to make its way through the other committees as well. Okay. And very briefly, the House uh, also passed a property tax bill. Mm -hmm. uh, without going too far into the weeds, sure. uh, what, what's going to happen? What's the outlook? Uh, ba basically, the uh, upside is uh, the residential homestead property tax rate is going to be going up by 0.2 cents. Mm -hmm. And the uh, non-residential and commercial is going to be going down by five-tenths of, of a cent. All right. Very right. good. We'll be right back with House Speaker Shap Smith to talk about some more issues from this week. Welcome back to Capital Beat. Joining us now, as promised, is House Speaker Shap Smith. Great to be here. Thank you, thank you. Um, earlier this week, uh, an issue sort of took off uh, when it became widely known that 13 dams on the Connecticut River are being put up for sale by TransCanada, who purchased them in 2005 when the state declined to uh, really make a competitive bid on purchasing them. You have been one of the most outspoken proponents of the state exploring potentially purchasing these dams again. Mm -hmm. Why is it so important for you and others? The governor has expressed interest, uh, even Treasurer Beth Pierce has said this is something the state should, should take a, a real look at. Why is it so important for the state to explore this possibility? Well, I think it's an incredible asset for the state of Vermont. and. Uh, you don't need to look any further than our neighboring state, New York, uh, that has an authority that owns a fair amount of uh, generation capacity uh, at the hydro level, right. and how it helps them. One, it really <coughs> creates a green portfolio for them, uh, so their energy is uh, very, very um, renewable. And uh, they use it as an economic development tool. They have low industrial rates, mm -hmm. and they are able to attract industry as a result of that. And so I think it's an asset that is really worth our looking at. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the economics may not work, uh, but I think the last time we looked at it, we had 
an administration that was skeptical about the idea. And I think we may be in a place where we would be more interested in buying it this time. And with a, a it, it's basically a once in a generation opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, it could define Vermont's economy and its energy portfolio over the next 100 years. There are 13 dams in total, Bellows Falls, uh, Vernon, and Wilder, I believe. And I think it's 460 megawatts of total output among them all. Um, in, in 2005, as we mentioned, they were purchased for $505 million. If you just <coughs> use basic inflation, we're talking about uh, a significant increase yep. in cost. And in a, we're in an economy now where the, the state revenues are not uh, increasing as much as we'd like and as much as they have in the past. So what are some of the questions that you personally would need to have answered uh, to have this make economic sense for the state? So, uh, you know, first of all, you need to know the kind of income that this would generate. Uh, this is a different type of capital purchase than one uh, that the state would typically make mm -hmm. because there is the income generation potential for it. So uh, what you need to do is uh, have an understanding of what the valuation of the dams is based on a historical um, income analysis as well as a uh, forward income analysis. And that will really help us understand whether we can even justify uh, putting out bonds for it. I think the other analysis that we need to make is what do the energy markets look like right now and what do they look like on a forward uh, basis? Uh, we would be making a bet that there might be a carbon tax in the future. If there was a carbon tax in the future, those assets would increase in value uh, significantly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that what we need is a rigorous analysis. It's not something where you just say, oh, well, this uh, seems like a good asset for the state of Vermont. Well, let's go bond for a billion dollars and mm -hmm. buy some dams. It really requires uh, some putting pencil to paper and really uh, getting getting the numbers done. Uh, you, you mentioned bonding. Is that really the only realistic way for the state to uh, move forward yeah. with the purchase? So I can't see us uh, consummating any sort of transaction like this without significant bonding. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be entirely state bonding. Uh, we have a portfolio of bonds called private activity bonds mm -hmm. that we might be able to use in conjunction with a private partner, okay. um, allowing us to uh, have an interest in the dams but share it with a private partner. So there, there are a number of different options that we could take in this. I think what's most important is understanding when you have an opportunity and saying, we're going to look at that opportunity. What I think happened in 2005 was a half-hearted, forced look at an opportunity that the governor at the time didn't want to take. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I think that colored the decision that we made. Now, uh, you're referring to former governor Jim Douglas. Um, Who has been pretty clear that he didn't he, think it was a good right, idea. Right, he, he actually, I spoke yeah. with him on Thursday, and yeah. he still says, you know, he believes that energy generation and distribution should remain in the, uh, in the private sector. Um, we have a governor now, Peter Shumlin, who ex expresses interest, a treasurer who has expressed interest, a leader of the House who expresses interest. Um, who, who will need to sit down in a room and actually... Um, hash out a way to move forward on this? Well, I think that all the people you've identified it will need uh, representatives of the governor, mm -hmm. uh, the legislature, and the treasurer's office. And then we'll also need a fair amount of support uh, from outside of the building, people mm -hmm. who uh, really know how to do a business valuation. Uh, and those are the things that we're going to have to do. Now, I'd like to just reply to the idea mm -hmm. that power should be uh, owned by private entities. We have a long history in the state of Vermont right. of municipal ownership of generation assets. So the idea, and, and in many instances, we consider it uh, to be a great strength of the state. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I don't share the view of the former governor that just because it's private ownership, it's good. Mm -hmm. um, I also don't believe that just because it's public ownership, right. it's good. I think in individual instances where uh, there are advantages to the state of Vermont, we ought to see if we can take that opportunity. 
Now, I'm assuming you and others who are supportive of exploring the purchase uh, will change your minds if it's a losing endeavor in terms of yeah. economic outlook. What if it's a break even? Is there a point of uh, sort of return on investment <clears throat> that you that you would need to see, or is breaking even enough of an incentive? I think that if it was a break even proposition on uh, the current set of factors, given the fact that uh, I believe within the next 20 years we'll probably have some pricing of carbon, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's worth taking a risk uh, because I think those dams will have upside potential. Uh, and uh, so my, my sense is uh, tie goes to purchase. Okay, fair enough. Uh, there's another issue sort of winding its way through the house right now that's been stalled, uh, independent contractor bill, which is <coughs> in essence how employers define who an employee is and who a independent contractor is. Um, there was a pretty overwhelming, I think a unanimous vote on the bailout of committee, and yet you wanted it recommitted um, into committee mm -hmm. to, to, for more time. Um, some, some people disagree, thinking they did their work, they came to a bipartisan or tripartisan consensus, and it should uh, hit the floor. Where are we with this bill, and why is it not ready for prime time, in your view? Well, so uh, another committee that uh, has uh, potentially has jurisdiction over the issue that's a labor-related committee, um, had a majority vote against the bill. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I saw was a potential conflict between committees coming to the floor. And typically, it, when that is uh, potentially going to happen, mm -hmm. we need to uh, see whether we can reach some sort of resolution between the two committees. So I think it's important to understand what this bill is about. To some degree, this redefines the relationship between employers and employees. Uh, in a country where people haven't had a raise for 15 years when you look at their real adjusted income, and uh, when people are feeling like they're falling further and further behind, and in a country where the employer-employee relationship used to define what the social safety net looks like, I don't think we ought to move precipitously in a direction that would redefine that relationship mm -hmm. with the possibility that we would cut further holes in the social safety net. And so uh, I, I want to commend the Commerce and Economic Development Committee because I think they are taking on an issue that reflects the changing realities on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see a bill moving forward. But if we're going to move a bill forward that cuts more holes in the social safety net that we already have, mm -hmm then I don't think that's an acceptable uh, option. So, uh, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with the chair of the uh, Commerce and Economic Development Committee. I went and spoke with him yesterday. It is not unusual for there to be conflict between committees and for a bill to take some time uh, before you have a vote on it to see if there can be some resolution. Ultimately, I'm committed to a solution to the problem not a statement kind of bill. And uh, what worries me is that some people are more interested in a statement mm -hmm. than actually trying to solve the problem. So you do see a, a path forward for this legislation this year? I am an eternal optimist. <laughs> and so I always believe that things can go until they can't. All right. We, uh, we've got five, six weeks perhaps left in this session. Um, Josh sat through a, a, a public hearing on marijuana last night. Um, <laughs> I'll let Josh describe uh, how that was and yeah. perhaps... Uh... Um, I, I, you know, I, having attended a lot of these public hearings, uh, I found it to be pretty pretty civil, wow. definitely more civil than the gun debate last year. Yeah. And, uh, but, um, you know, in general, we heard the same arguments that we, we, we've been hearing, I think, at least since, since January. Um, do you, what, do you, what do you see right now? I understand that this thing might potentially be coming out of House Judiciary next week. Do you understand that as well? Well, I haven't had a chance to debrief with the uh, chair and the vice chair of the committee. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think what you hear from people is an acknowledgement that the policy of prohibition does not work and that we are likely to move to a legal and regulated uh, market. I think the question that many people have is, is this the time uh, and is the structure that has been put forth by the Senate the right structure and does it address the concerns that have been raised, particularly about youth use of marijuana uh, and safety on the roads. 
that's the, I think those are the issues that the Committee uh, on Judiciary is grappling with. Whether those have been fully resolved, I think is an open question. I'm gonna work with the committee to see whether there's a path forward. As I've said in the press a number of times, I don't think that the bill in its current form has support within the House to get all the way through. Any other uh, surprises coming our way in the next five or six weeks? Well, if they were surprises, I wouldn't tell you them. <laughs> Fair enough. Any, anything we can expect in the next five or six weeks? Well, I think uh, one of the surprises is that we're pretty much on track mm -hmm. to uh, get out of here by early May. Early May. And uh, you know, with a relatively difficult budget, and with some thorny issues yeah. like uh, paid sick leave and uh, the marijuana bill, the idea that we were going to be able to get out uh, on time I, or before mm -hmm. actually we were scheduled to be there is a good thing. Uh, last session last year we saw at the end um, some back and forth over various taxes. Do you see any potential uh, questionable items either in the tax bill or the budget that might cause tension between you, the governor, and the Senate? Uh, I'm sure that there are, uh, and my sense is that they're not as deep or uh, problematic as uh, the last couple of years. And last thing, uh, there's been some uh, bills dealing with tobacco in the, in the House this week. Uh, the House voted for a 92% excise tax on e-cigarettes. Um, I guess on Tuesday you'll debate raising the, the age uh, to purchase tobacco to 21. Um, why so much focus on, on tobacco stuff this year? Is this just driven by membership? Yeah, I mean, there are people who are really concerned about uh, not only increased uh, smoking tobacco mm -hmm. use, uh, but the um, significant increase in the use of uh, smokeless tobacco, e-cigarettes. Right. You know, uh, I think that what's important to think about is um, years ago, nobody really thought that PFOA, which is now uh, considered a, a pollutant, right. Uh, was that significant and it was problematic. Uh, and I think people have real concerns about whether the same thing may be true for e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, some pretty significant chemical content to those particular uh, devices mm -hmm. and I think people are concerned about the health consequences in the future, trying to um, put some price on, on those items to discourage use. And do you see a path forward on Tuesday for raising voting in favor of raising the, the age? Of I think it'll be close. I don't know whether it'll pass. All right. House Speaker Shep Smith, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. All right. And that'll be a wrap for us on uh, Capital Beat this week. You can tune in and watch it on orcamedia.net or vermontpressbureau.com. Thanks again.